Welcome back, everybody. We're going to continue the biological perspective, and we're going to focus on neurons, hormones, and the brain in this lecture. So let me kind of bring a brief introduction into this. So Oliver Sacks was a neuroscientist and psychiatrist who worked with uh, different patients, and uh, he studied these different cases and wrote them in this book of called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat and Other Clinical Tales. So one such case is Emily D., who was a former English teacher and a poet who had a tumor in a part of the brain processes of the expressive qualities of speech, such as rhythm and intonation. So what happened with this tumor is it left her unable to tell emotion and intent when it came to a speaker's voice unless she looked at the gestures that the person was making in their body language as well as looking at the facial expressions. So you could say that she was kind of deaf to those nuances of speech, but she was able to kind of tell liars uh, apart from those who told the truth very easily because she couldn't be swayed by, say, the verbal theatrics. So she looked at body language and facial expressions in particular. And it's been noted that when it comes to speech, only a small percentage of what you say is actually what matters. It's more like how you say things, what your facial expressions are, and what your body language is, is what matters most rather than the actual contents of your of your speech. And then another case, and this is, of course, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, was this Dr. P, who was considered a cultured and charming uh, musician of great repute. I mean, he ended up suffering brain damage in, in, in a part of the brain that handles visualization. And he would end up patting fire hydrants on the head and thinking they were kids playing, but they weren't kids, they were fire hydrants. And uh, for some reason, he thought his wife's head was his hat, and so he would try to lift her up by the head to put his hat on. And so this neurologist, like I said, Oliver Sacks, he kind of studied these cases, and he wrote a book about him, calling it, of course, the book. Uh, you can see in the picture here on the slide, you know, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Now, because the brain is the site of consciousness, however, people fundamentally disagree on how to describe it because it's at what point do you end and say the brain just doing its thing, where does that begin? So there's, there's a bit of contentions amongst, that amongst philosophers and neuroscientists. So let's look at the nervous system, right? This is just a basic blueprint of it, right? According to the picture, you can see there, there's the brain and the spinal cord, which makes up the central nervous system, and then... Apart from that, you have the ganglia and the nerves, and that's considered the peripheral nervous system because it lays outside of the main central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. So the function of the nervous system is, of course, to gather and process information and produce responses to the stimuli that comes from that information outside the body. Um, you know, and... It can, they also coordinate the workings of every cell and even the lowly jellyfish and even the worm kind of have the beginnings of such a, a basic system. And when we talk about the behaviorists in the next set, the next two sets of, of lectures, we're going to talk about um, Soklov and the, the, what he called the orienting reflex, which is the most simple part of learning, which is stimulus response. And you could think of it this way is... So what Sokolov did was he had these snails and he would tap this, he would tap on the snail's shell and the snail would go inside of its shell and he'd come out, be tapped again and go back in, go back out. And you do this for about 15 or 20 more times and then the snail eventually just kind of stops responding to that. And so Sokolov thought of that as the snail kind of orienting to the stimulus of, of being tapped on the shell, just kind of oriented or become habituated to it let's say and so that's kind of what we're talking about when we say you know jellyfish and worms even have a nervous system or at least the beginnings of a of such a nervous system and in simple organisms their systems typically do a little more than like move eat eliminate wastes and respond to external stimuli but human beings on the other hand tend to do more complex things such as dancing cooking reading playing music and all of these different things <clears throat> So scientists have divided 
the, ner the nervous system into two parts. You have the central nervous system. Again, that's the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system, which makes up the, which is made up of the ganglia and the nerves. So the CNS, it basically receives, it processes, interprets, and it stores any incoming sensory information and stimuli about taste, sound, smells, color, any pressure on the skin, things of that nature. And it also kind of tends to send messages out to the internal organs, the glands, the muscles. It's like if something's in your way, uh, if you're walking down the street, the CNS will see object in way and send messages to like your legs to jump over said barrier or to step over it rather than just walk right into it. You could think of it that way. And um, let's see, we, talk, we talked about the two main components of the CNS, but with the spinal cord in particular, and the reason why it's bolded down there is that it actually is considered an extension of the brain. And it runs from the base of the brain back all the way down the center of the back and acts as kind of like a bridge between the brain and the parts of the body below the neck. So it kind of deals with your legs, deals with your arms and everything below the neck. So um, the peripheral nervous system handles all the central nervous system's input and output. It contains all the portions of the nervous system and of the nervous system outside of the brain and the spinal cord right down to the tips of the fingers and toes that's what the ganglia is for so you have ganglia it goes all the way down your arm and it goes so you can do stuff with your hands or you have ganglia down to your legs and that's kind of what moves out everything in your feet and your toes and all of that you can think of the brain without the ability to collect data from the world would be kind of like a radio without a receiver just be static just all the time and of course we don't think in static or at least i bloody well hope we don't but in the pns or the peripheral nervous system these sensory nerves that are part of that carry the messages from the special receptors in your skin your muscles and other internal and external sense organs and they send that to the spinal cord which sends it on up into the brain and these nerves kind of they kind of put us in touch with both the outside world and the activities of our own bodies now you have motor nerves and those carry orders from the central nervous system down to muscles glands and internal organs they enable us to move our bodies about they also cause glands to contract and secrete substances which we call hormones hence why it's part of the subtitle of the lecture about neurons hormones and all that good stuff there um, and so these hormones the chemical messengers there now scientists have diverted diverted divided the peripheral nervous system into two parts you have the somatic ner peripheral nervous system and the autonomic or the self-governing systems so the somatic nervous system, it's also called the skeletal nervous system, consists of all the nerves that are connected to the sensory receptors to the skeletal muscles. That's what allows you to move your hand, move your fingers, move your arm. It's what you flex when you're trying to show off if you like to lift weights and things of that nature. Whereas your autonomic nervous system regulates the functioning of your blood vessels, the glands, the internal organs such as the heart, the bladder, the lungs, the stomach, all of that. It's also where you it's also what reacts to emotions such as fear it's what makes your palm sweat and your heart rate increase all of that is just the autonomic nervous system kind of at work there so here's the basic brute basic blueprint even further right so you have the nervous system that's broken down into the central and the peripheral the peripheral gets broken down into the autonomic and somatic that's the body and the automatic well, the automatic or autonomous nervous system itself gets divided and fractionated again into two more parts known as the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, right? And these kind of work together, kind of like the breaking gas in a car. And I'll explain that metaphor here in a second. And well, because the gas is the stop or no, the, the brake is the stop, the gas is the go. So that's the opposite uh nature of these two sim systems that's why they work in opposite ways to adjust the body to changing circumstances and we can think of that as also like a watts governor which if you look at the picture down at the screen in fact i will take me off here for a second because that shows you what the watts governor looks like right 
So the sympathetic nervous system mobilizes the body for action. That's what allows that that's what motivates action to go forward. That's get your heart rate increased, get your blood pressure up for when you need to like say flee a predator or fight an enemy. But the parasympathetic system acts like a break. It slows things down until they can revert to normal. And the reason why we say like a Watts governor is because the faster that thing goes, you're ready for action. So your heart rate's going to increase, your blood pressure is going to increase. But if it slows down and goes the other way because it's getting closed off from whatever the stimuli is, it means the stimuli is gone that got your heart rate up. Well, then it starts to slow everything down. So it's kind of like pumping the brakes in the car, it brings everything back down to its normal level. You could think of it that way. And there's a reason why the Watts governor is a really good metaphor for that because. Well, there's two representations of the mind if you're in, interested in cognitive science, and that's the the com computational. Uh, what would you say? That's the computational representation of the mind. And so, what that means is that the mind's like a computer. You just have input coming in and output going out, and kind of it, like that. Whereas the mind, like a Watts governor, that's what's that's that's partially metaphorical due to embodied cognition because you're as if your cognition's embodied then you have to act out what you think and so you have to have more energy to react to a stimulus so you're going to have more input coming in in a faster rate so your heart rate's going to increase and things of that nature and slow it down just like a, a watts governor does so you can think of it that way so there's three types of nerve cells there's sensory neurons, there's relay neurons, and then there's, of course, the motor neurons. I couldn't remember that right off the top of my head, so I kind of had to um, pop out for a second. So the blueprint that we just described provides a general idea of the nervous system's structure, but there's some details here, and so we're going to talk about these neurons. The, the nervous system is made up of thousands, if not millions of neurons which are held in place by glial cells and that's of course the greek word for glue so these glial cells greatly outnumber the neurons but they also provide the neurons with nutrients it insulates them and it removes cellular debris whenever they undergo apoptosis and these neurons these nerve cells die now many neuroscientists suspect that the glial cells also carry the electrical and chemical signals between the parts of the nervous system and that these signals somehow influence the activity of neighboring neurons and we're going to talk about what that means here so a neuron has three main parts three main components you have dendrites you have the cell bodies and then you have the axons and they look like branches of a tree and of course the word dendrite means little tree also from the greek language they act like antennas receiving messages from as many as 10,000 other cell other nerve cells and transmitting these messages toward the cell bodies. Now the cell body is shaped kind of like a sphere or a pyramid and it contain the biochemical machinery for keeping the neuron alive. It also decides when and if a neuron needs to fire that it means to transmit a message from one f neuron based on its inputs that it's received. Now the axon which is from the Greek word ac that means axle transmits these messages away from the cell body to the other neurons or to muscles or to glands and they vary in size from four thousandths of an inch to a few feet long so many axons especially the larger ones are insulated by a surrounding layer of fatty material called the myelin sheath which is derived from those glial cells that we talked about this covering is divided into these different segments that make it kind of like the links of a sausage. It's like if you go to the butcher shop or anywhere else and you can buy link sausage where they're all connected together. And I didn't mean to hit the mic there, so I apologize for that. Now, one purpose of the myelin sheath is to prevent signals from adjacent neurons from interfering with each other. But it also speeds up the conduction of the neural impulses. And individuals with multiple cirrhosis, they kind of have a loss of myelin which causes erratic nerve signals and, and fires that lead to paralysis, weakness, and a loss of sensation amongst other symptoms.
Now, in the peripheral nervous system, the fibers of individual neurons, axons, and sometimes dendrites are all collected together in these bundles called nerves. You could think of them as lines in a telephone cable. If you've seen a telephone cable and you strip off the outer insulation, then you have all these individual wires that are kind of laid into that. So you can think of it that way. Now, the human body has 43 pairs of peripheral nerves. And from nerves, each pair is on the left side of the body and the other is on the right. And most of these nerves either enter or leave the spinal cord. And these 12 pairs in the head or the cranial nerves connect directly to the brain itself. So let's uh, see here. Now, until recently, neuroscientists thought that neurons within the central nervous system, they couldn't reproduce or regenerate after an injury. The assumption that there were no CNS neurons that arose from infancy or what if cells in the brain or spinal cord were damaged, they couldn't be fixed, or that got tossed out the window. And that's because animal studies have shown that if you sever an axon in the spinal cord, it can regrow if you treat them with certain nervous system chemicals. Uh, Canadian neuroscientists have been working with mice and they discovered precursor cells, or which are like these immature cells that will give birth to new, new neurons when immersed in a growth promoting protein in the lab. And these new neurons will continue to divide and multiply. And since then, scientists have learned that the human brain also contains precursor cells and they too will grow in the lab. And what's even more amazing about that is that rodents and monkeys also have these precursor cells in areas of the brain associated with learning and memory that continue to divide and mature through adulthood. So now research into the brains of elderly people who have died of cancer shows evidence of that same process. Now animal studies have also shown that we can have some control over the process. And we do that by engaging in physical and mental exercises that promote the production and survival of those cells. You could think of it as being in line with the old saying of use it or lose it. So it can, it can atrophy and you, you lose it. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Now, a lot of information on this slide. Neurons do not directly touch each other end to end, but instead they're separated by these minuscule spaces called synaptic clefts. And so that's where the axon terminal of one neuron nearly touches the dendrite or the cell body of another, and the axon terminal, the cleft, and the covering membranes of all of that, of the receiving dendrite, is called a synapse. And because neuron axons have hundreds or even thousands of terminals, a single neuron may have a synaptic connection with many other cells. And as a result of this, the number of communication links in the nervous system runs in the trillions or perhaps even in the quadrillions. So it's not exactly unreasonable to say that there's more connections in the human brain than there are observable stars in the universe. You could think of it that way. So when we're born, most of these synapses haven't yet formed, but during the first 15 months of light, there is an explosion in new connections. And during the course of life, axons and dendrites continue to grow and tiny bump-like projections on dendrites called spines increase in both number and size, resulting in new, more complex synaptic connections. And just as new learning and stimulating environments promote the production of these new neurons, they also produce the greatest increase in synaptic complexity. So scientists refer to this brain's remarkable flexibility as plasticity. And plasticity may explain how people with traumatic brain injuries make many remarkable recoveries. One example being that people who have a stroke and lose the ability to speak end up speaking normally within a few months. And that's because the brains are very, have a great plasticity about it because it's very flexible. Now, neurons speak to one another in some, or in some cases, glands and muscles and, and what's called an electrical or chemical language. And so, when the cell is stimulated, charge in electrical potential occurs between the inside and the outside, outside of the cell. The physics of this process involves the sudden momentary inflow of positively charged sodium ions across that cell's membrane, followed by an outflow of positively charged potassium ions. And what happens when they mix is this electrical voltage or what's called an action potential is produced and produces the electrical current or the impulse. Now, if an axon is unmyelinated, 
The action potential at each point in the axon gives rise to a new action potential at the next point. Thus, the action potential moves down the axon to the next point like fire kind of traveling down a, f a fuse. If you've ever seen like the old Bugs Bunny cartoons, you have like the little TNT thing with the little wire out to light the fuse and it just kind of goes along, goes along before boom, it blows up. <laughs> However, in myelinated axons, the process is a bit different. Conduction of a neural impulse under the sheath is impossible in part because of the sodium and potassium ions can't cross into the cell's membrane except at the breaks of the nodes between the little links or the myelin of the myelin sausage there. Now, when the impulse reaches the axon's terminal button like tip, it has to get to the next cell across the synaptic cleft. At this point, synaptic vesicles in the tip of the axon terminal open up and release what's called a neurotransmitter to carry the impulse. And we'll talk about the neurotransmitters. What they are is there are chemical substances that are released by transmitting neurons at the synapse and it alters the activity of the receiving neuron. When they reach the other side, the neurotransmitter molecules bind briefly with the receptor sites and special molecules in the membranes of the receiving neurons. They fit these sites like a key. You can think of it as like everything's fitting together into a lock. And when the changes occur in the receiving neuron's membranes, the ultimate effect is either excitatory or positive ionization or an inhibitory or negative ionization, depending on which receptor sites have been activated. But what any given neuron does at any given time depends on the net effect of all the messages being received from the neurons. Only when the cell's voltage reaches threshold does it fire. Thousands of messages, both excitatory or inhibitory, may be coming down the cell, so the neurons have to have have to average them out, but how that happens isn't obvious or necessarily understood, and the message that reaches the end step depends on the rate at which the individual neurons are firing, how many of them are firing, and the types of neurons that are firing, and where they're located. So it's not a matter of how strongly they fire, because it it's either it does or it doesn't. You could think of that like a switch. It's either the switch is on or it's off. There's no in between. There's no dimmer there. The light's either on or it's off. Now the nervous system house would remain forever dark and lifeless without chemical carriers such as neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters make it possible for one neuron to excite or inhibit another and neurotransmitters exist not only in the brain, but also in the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves, and in certain glands. Though the effects on the specific nerve circuits, these substances can affect their moods, they can affect memory, and well-being in very different various ways, with the nature of the effect depending on the level of the neurotransmitter and its location. Now, while the number of known and unsuspected, and suspected transmitters, neurotransmitters increase, here are a few of the better known uh, and understood uh, neurotransmitters and some of their effects. So serotonin is the big one, right? That neuron is involved in sleep cycles, your appetite, your sensory perception, your temperature regula regulation, pain suppression. Of course, the most well-known effect is on mood because if you have low serotonin, then you're depressed and anxious and... So that's why you would be prescribed an SSRI or reuptake inhibitor. So that way you still have enough serotonin in the brain to increase your mood. So that decreases depressive symptoms and depression and also decreases anxiety. You think of it that way. Dopamine affects neurons that are involved in involuntary move, or voluntary movement, learning, memory, and emotion. Acetylcholine affects neurons involved in muscle action, cognitive functioning, memory, and emotion. Norepinephrine affects neurons involving the heart rate that increases it, the slowing of intestinal activity during stress, and also the neurons that are involved in learning, memory, dreaming, waking from sleep, and emotion. GABA or gamma aminobiotic acids Function is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, so that's what inhibits and slows down your heart rate and things of that nature after the norepinephrine increases things. And then you have glutamate, which functions as the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain and plays a critical role in long-term memory. Think of it that way.
So the harmful effects that can occur if neurotransmitter levels become too high or low, well, as I just discussed, extremely low serotonin and norepinephrine are associated with severe depressive disorder, such as major depressive disorder. Abnormal GABA levels have been implicated in sleep and eating disorders along with convulsive disorders. Another group of chemical messengers which we talked about or we haven't talked about is endorphins, which have a similar effect to natural opi opiates. They reduce pain and they promote pleasure, but they are also thought to play a role in appetite, sexual activity, blood pressure, mood, learning, and memory. Some endorphins function like neurotransmitters, but they're often neuromodulators, which alter the effects of neurotransmitters. For example, example either limiting or prolonging the effects of those neurotransmitters. <coughs> Excuse me. Endorphins were first identified in the early 1970s by Candace Pert and Solomon Snyder in 1973. This is when they were conducting research on morphine and found that the morphine works by binding to receptors in the brain. So what that means is that animals involved that animals evolved receptors for those chemicals and they have to create their own opiate like morphine chemicals or endorphins. The hypothesis would be later confirmed by other researchers. Endorphin levels seem to shoot up when an animal or human is afraid or under duress. Not that's not an accident by the way by making pain tolerable in situations. Endorphins have given species in a, a, a huge evolutionary advantage like when an organism is threatened it needs to do something fast pain can hinder that process you could think of it as like this when a mouse stops to lick a wounded paw it becomes the cat's dinner so that mouse has to ignore the injured paw until it can get away from the cat because i don't imagine being eaten by a cat to, i wouldn't say that's what a mouse sets out to do endorphins are also linked to pleasure of social contact for example, when young puppies, guinea pigs, and even chicks are injected with morphine or endorphins, they'll either show more dis or less distress when separated from their mothers, and when those receptors are blocked, they cry more. The findings seem to suggest that endorphins stimulates euphoria stimulated endorphin stimulated euphoria motivates children to seek affection and cuddling. So you can think of it that way. So we're going to talk about communication in the nervous system and the chemical messengers in the nervous system, right? So hormones, which make up the third class of chemical messengers, are produced primarily in the endocrine glands, and they're released directly into the bloodstream, which carries them to organs and cells that might be far more from the point farther from the point of origin. So, for example, adrenal hormones, which are produced by the adrenal glands, which are perched above your kidneys. They're involved in stress and emotion and these hormones will surge if you're laughing at a funny movie or if you're worried about taking an exam or if you've got somebody chasing after you because they're going to beat you up. Now the outer part of each adrenal gland produces cortisol which increases blood sugar levels and boosts your energy but they also produce epinephrine or adrenaline and norepinephrine. These hormones activate the sympathetic nervous system which increases one's arousal level and prepares them for action. So you could just say that hormones like, a, like norepinephrine and adrenaline, basically they're predicated on either on stimuli that you need to react to in the fight or flight response. That's the right way of thinking of that. You have melatonin, which is secreted in the pineal gland, which is deep within the brain. It promotes sleep and it circulates your circadian rhythms, which is your sleep-wake cycles that happen within a 24-hour period. The circadian rhythms are controlled by a biological clock, clock, not clack, clock. Biological clock and overall coordinator is located in that tiny teardrop-shaped cluster of cells called the suprachiasmatic nucleus or the SCN, which is located in the hypothalamus. Now, melatonin also seems to promote sleep. So when you go to sleep in a darkened room, your melatonin levels fall, and you wake up in a lighted room, the melatonin levels rise. So animal studies suggest that information about light and dark reaches the pineal gland through the neural pathway that leads from the back of the eye. And through that suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the SCN, and onto the pineal gland, Interestingly enough, in some blind people who lack light perception, the normal melatonin cycle is absent. 
And so as a result of that, they are more prone to suffer from insomnia and other sleep disorders. Sex hormones are secreted by tissues in the in the gonads. That's the testes in males and the ovaries in females. And also in the adrenal glands. This occurs in both sexes, but in differing amounts and proportions in males and females after puberty. Androgens, the most important being testosterone or masculizing hormones, produced mainly in the testes, but also in the female ovaries and in the adrenal glands. But, they're, but males obviously have more testosterone than, than females do. Estrogen, on the other hand, is the feminizing hormone. And it brings on the physical changes that females experience at puberty, such as you know development of the breasts, onset of menstruation, it influences the menstrual cycle course, and progesterone contributes to the growth and maintenance of the uterine lining in preparation for egg fertilization, among other functions. Researchers are also studying the involvement of sex hormones in the non-reproductive, non-sexual realms, such as sex hormones and in their effect on memory. So it's kind of cool to see how that might play out. So now we're going to map the brain. As you can see from the picture there, the brain is very, very complex. Because you have the premotor cortex, the Broca's area, the prefrontal cortex, the left cerebral hemisphere, the primary auditory cortex, the pons, the medulla oblongata, the spinal cord. I'm going to remove my video here for a second so you can see the cerebellum the optic radiation, the primary visual cortex, the gustatory area, the parietal lobe, the primary somatic sensory cortex, the motor cortex, and of course the premotor cortex. So you kind of see we went all the way around the brain. So this is considered the main room of the nervous system house. It's the brain. It's the little what they call the gray matter between your ears. And as amazing as that is, that, that walnut glo shaped glob of tissue that looks like the growth has gotten out of hand is responsible for such thing as writing Hamlet, discovering radium, inventing the paperclip. And it even named itself because we have brains and we call it the brain. The brain is encased in a thick protective vault of bone. And so you might ask yourself, well, how in the hell are neuroscientists and, and neuropsychologists studying the brain? Well, one approach is to study patients who've had part of the brain damaged or removed because of injury or disease. Another is called the lesion method, which is damaging or removing sections of the brain in animals and then seeing what happens. But I can tell you right now that the way the ethics boards run, you can't really do that anymore. You can't just go around stirring brains with a stick and like say a house cat or a dog and then sit back and watch what happens and expect to get any um, funding for it. <laughs> in fact, there's this old joke that we used to sit, talk about when I was in biology, funnily enough. It was, uh, what do you get when you cross a cow with an octopus? And the most common answer would be a, a cow that could milk, it, milk itself. But the actual punchline is that the ethics committee will uh, take your funding away from you. So... It's not as funny as I thought it would be, but there you go. Um, so the brain can also be probed with devices called electrodes, and some electrodes are coin-shaped and are simply pasted or taped onto the scalp, and they detect, detect the electrical activity of the millions of neurons in the brain in particular regions. And they're widely used in medical diagnosis and research. Um, the electrodes are wired up to a machine that translates the electrical energy from the brain into these wavy lines uh, on a moving piece of paper, visual patterns on a screen. And that's why the electrical patterns of the brain are called brain waves. Uh, different wave patterns are associated with sleep, relaxation, mental concentration. And the brain wave recording is also called an electroencephalogram or an EEG. And it is useful, but not very precise because it reflects the activities of many cells at once. Listening to the brain with an EEG machine is like standing outside a sports stadium. You know there's something happening there, but you're not quite sure what it is. And fortunately now, computer technology can be combined with an EEG to get a better picture of what's going on as far as brain activity goes and the patterns associated with specific events and mental processes. The technology to get a clearer picture of the brain and those processes 
and um, the technology basically what it does is it suppresses all of the background noise leaving only the patterns of electrical responses to the event that's actually being studied to be even more precise in the information gathering researchers can use a little electrical electrodes that are like needles they're very thin wires and sometimes they're hollow glass tubes that can be inserted into the brain itself either directly in an exposed brain or through tiny holes in the skull only the skull and the membranes around the brain need to be in and it's basically need to be numbed through anesthesia and paradoxically the brain itself which possesses all the sensation and feeling feels nothing when it's touched Therefore, a human patient or animal can be awake and feel no pain during any sort of procedure that deals with its brain. Needle electrodes can both record electrical activity in the brain or can actually stimulate areas with the brain with weak little electric pulses. Uh, pulses. Weak electrical pulses, which when certain areas are stimulated, there are specific sensations or movements that can result from those. And these needles can be so fine that they can be inserted into actual single individual neuron cells which is actually pretty cool now since the 1970s even more amazing doors to the brain have been opened such as the the posit positron emission tomography or the pet scan it goes beyond anatomy to record biochemical changes in the brain as they're happening in real time which is pretty cool and so one type of pet scan takes advantage of the fact that nerve cells convert glucose the body's main fuel and energy and so now the PET scans were originally diagnosed to or originally designed to diagnose abnormalities and have prov provided evidence that certain brain areas and people with emotional disorders are either unusually quiet or unusually active there's this one cannot remember his name but he uh, he studied psychopaths through pet scans and the 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 interestingly enough people with psychopathic personality disorder which is a subset of antisocial personality if you put them in a pet scan you give them all kinds of different stimuli such as things that would that, that evoke emotion such as fear or anxiety uh, empathy all of these things the amygdala is kind of where those emotional responses are kind of how that's that's where they're formed at is in the amygdala in the frontal lobe of the brain and what has happened is when you look at psycho people that with psychopathy the amygdala is unusually quiet it's like almost like that part of the brain doesn't even work and what was interesting is the gentleman even took a scan of his own brain as a control and come to find out that he has the same brain activity as most psychopaths but the guy's never committed a crime in fact he's a neuroscientist and so he was kind of looking back at that and realized that you know perhaps it's the upbringing so perhaps psychopaths are, are are made as opposed to just born because he had the right sort of upbringing that he's not a uh he's not a criminal or a murderer or a predator or anything of that nature so i figured i would share that with you before we went back when we talked about you know not only do they show which parts of the brain are active during ordinary activities and emotions but also lets researchers see which areas are the busiest when a person hears a song, recalls a sad memory, works on a math problem, or shifts attention from one task to another? Another technique used in both medical diagnosis and brain research is called the MRI or magnetic resonance imaging, which allows the exploration of the inner space without injecting chemicals or putting needles or doing any of this stuff. And what happens is these powerful magnetic fields and radio frequencies are used to produce vibrations in the nuclei of the atoms making up the body organs and the vibrations are then picked up as signals by these special receivers in the mri machine and a computer analyzes the signals and converts them into high contrast pictures of the organ itself now there is an ultra fast version of this called the fmri or functional mri what well, looks at blood flow and how that does how that's done is by picking up the magnetic signals from the blood that has been that has pretty much given up its oxygen to the active brain cells it can capture brain changes many times a second as a person performs a single task 
other scanning techniques that were becoming available with every passing year and some will convert still pictures into moving pictures that show changes in the brain as well as on a three-dimensional image you can look at it that way which is also pretty 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 interesting and pretty cool so now we're going to begin our tour of the brain all modern brain theories assume that major brain parts perform different though some overlapping tasks and this concept is known as localization of function and this goes back to at least researcher Joseph Gall, who lived from 1758 to 1828. And Gall was this astronomer, uh, Austrian anatom anatomist. Finally got a big word right. And so he thought that personality traits were reflected in the development of special specific areas of the brain. And Gall's theory of phrenology was completely wrong, but his general notion of specialization of the brain actually had merit. So we're going to talk about that, right? So here's the tour through the brain. So you have the brain stem, which make, is the pons, the medulla, and the reticular activating system there. It's found at the base of the skull, which began to evolve some 500 million years ago in segmented worms. The brain stem looks like a stalk coming out of the spinal cord with pathways to and from the upper areas. And it passed through the main two structures, and we just talked about that, the medulla and the pons. The pons is involved in your sleeping, your walking, and your dream, dreaming. The medulla is responsible for your bodily functions that do not have to be consciously willed, such as your heart rate or your breathing. Hanging is a method of execution that's considered very effective because when the neck breaks, the nervous pathways from the medulla are completely severed stopping your respiration which results in death and you know there's there's no need in the comments to say well no shit sherlock if you have uh no activity for the medulla then you're not going to be alive that that's just obvious i just thought i'd put it out there because that's explains why hanging was so effective now extending upward from the core of the brain stem is the reticular activating system. That's that little worm looking thing there in the center of the pons and the medulla. And it's a network of neurons that extends from above the brain stem and into the center of the brain and has connections with the higher brain areas. It screens incoming information, arouses the higher centers when something that happens demands your attention. It means it's numinous, it's meaningful. You're, it's, you're going to adjust your perception to whatever that stimulus is. And without the RAS, there would be no consciousness or arousal or attention. So that's one of the theories is that reticular activating system is part of what where, where consciousness comes from. You can think of it that way. The cerebellum stands on top of the brain stem and it has these two lobe structures the size of a small fist it's the lesser brain you could call it that and that's what contributes to your sense of balance and coordination so that the muscle movements are smooth and they're precise if the cerebellum is damaged a person might become clumsy or uncoordinated or have difficulty using a pencil or threading a needle or even riding a bike and walking and it's also responsible for simple skills and reflexes it's like if you go to the doctor and they hit your knee with that little little hammer that tests your reflexes and when you're when you hit your knee and your your foot flips up well that's your cerebellum at work um it also contributes to some of the higher order processes of sensory information and it can assist with problem solving and understanding words the thalamus plays part of traffic officer, right? It's got these little flags, metaphorically speaking, because what it does is it relays the motor impulses from the higher centers to the spinal cord and conversely, as sensory data comes into the brain, the thalamus is sitting there directing them to the higher centers. For example, when you see a sunset, the thalamus directs the data from the to the visual area of the brain. So from the eyes to the back of the head there, same with auditory information the olfactory bulb is the only place in the brain that works independently of the thalamus so it smells its own independent thing now the olfactory bulb is located near the emotion area of the brain which is near the amygdala because your nose is here so the olfactory bulb is kind of like there the amygdala is here which is thought to explain why certain smells will trigger memories of personal experiences so for example if you're unfortunate enough to be near like a loved one after they've passed, uh, 
because dead bodies smell and they smell unbelievably awful. So if you're ever around something that smells that awful, it'll trigger the memory of like you being around a loved one that's been passed for a while. Um, the hypothalamus and the pituitary – well, here, here's a better example too of the other one before we go into the hypothalamus. It was uh, flowers. Like if you have a wife or a girlfriend or even when you were younger, if your mother had a particular flower that she liked – and if they had a very strong odor to them that every time you smell that flower, it will remind you of your mom or your wife, girlfriend, sister, whomever. So you think of it that way. That's why you know certain smells bring back memories. Now to the point of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Well, they both lie under the thalamus, and it's involved in those drives associated with survival both of the individual and the species, hunger, sex, emotion, and thirst. It also regulates bodily temperature through shivering or sweating, and it also controls the complex operations of the autonomic nervous system, which also includes the the S the the S and C, which I cannot remember what it said at the time, so I was looking to see if I had a type there. But hanging down from the hypothalamus is the pituitary gland, and that is the supervisor gland because. The hormones it secretes affects all the other endocrine glands. However, the real boss is the hypothalamus. And the reason why I kind of giggle when we talked about the drives is if you remember from the lecture where we talked about Freud and Freud thought of you know the pleasure principle that you know human beings move toward pleasure and away from pain. And it's those drives that fundamentally drive your conscious and unconscious processes. And this is before we got into the more complex neuroscience that we have today. So it's kind of interesting how Freud is an as a as a neurologist and a physiologist and, and, and his method of psychoanalysis and drives it just kind of comes together in a in a way that you wouldn't think about unless you know you were really thinking about like Freud and, and his thinking and the way that he approach the mind so I, I i thought that was kind of interesting that that just kind of popped in there so i thought i'd share that with you guys the limbic system is a set of loosely interconnected structures as many connections to the hypothalamus these structures tend to be the border between your higher and your lower parts of your brain some anatomists include the hypothalamus into the limbic system as parts of the thalamus and the as well as part of the thalamus in that limbic system, although the usefulness and speaking of the limbic system as an integrated set of structures is still being disputed and argued. Uh, the limbic system is heavily involved in emotions such as fear and rage. Uh, many years ago, James Olds and Peter Milner found pleasure centers in the limbic system by training rats to push a lever in order to to get a buzz of electricity delivered through the tiny electrodes in their limbic system. Some rats would press that bar thousands of times an hour for 15 to 20 hours at a time until they collapsed from exhaustion. And when they revived, they went back to the bar. And then when forced to choose, these hedonistic rats would choose the electrical stimulation over food, water, or even a rat of the opposite sex making provocative mating gestures. Today, however, researchers believe that brain stimulation activates the neural pathways rather than discrete centers, and that changes in neurotransmitter and it seems that changes in neurotransmitter and neuromodulators and their levels are involved in that. You could think of the co the, the rodent as cocaine addicted, that it would rather have the electrical impulses as a stand-in metaphor for cocaine, so it's going to be like, oh, well, there's food, but I'd rather have the pleasure. Or I don't care about the female rat. I would rather pull this lever and get the electrical equivalent to, say, a high from, from cocaine. One limbic structure that is important in psychological functions, and we talked about this before, is the amygdala, which is responsible for evaluating your sensory information Instantly determining its emotional importance and contributing to the initial decision on whether to approach or withdraw from that person or situation. So we're, this is where we're going to – you could look at negative and positive emotion as what motivates your approach or withdrawal responses. For example, the amygdala quickly assesses danger or threat. 
And that's a good thing because otherwise you could be standing on the street asking, is it wise to cross now? While at that very moment, a large truck is hurtling towards you. The amygdala's initial reaction may be overridden by an accurate appraisal from the cerebral cortex. That is why you may jump with fear when you feel a hand on your shoulder in the dark, but the fear subsides when the cortex registers the hand as belonging to a friend with a sense of humor. And that might be why you stop before you decide to just pull back and punch him in the nose. Now, if there's damage to the amygdala or the cortex, emotional abnormalities can and will manifest themselves. A rat with a damaged amygdala may forget to be afraid when it should be. I don't think that's necessarily right, and I'll tell you why. A cat, the natural state of a rat is not to be just calm. The natural state of the rat is to be afraid but realize that it's not going to die at that moment. That's why if you take a rat, say, out of its natural normal habitat and say you put it in, its, in a new cage, well, the rat's going to sit there and shake for a second. And then it's going to sniff a little bit. And then it's going to kind of move a little bit. And then it's going to stop. It's going to sniff around a little bit. So it's you're, you're taking it out of its known territory into this unknown unexplored territory of the new cage and then it's going to engage in exploratory behavior but it stops and pauses because it's as it moves forward it's like well okay i'm safe not dead yet we're good and then we're going to continue to explore a little more and then try to expand that explored territory more and more and more until the cage is fully explored rather than so it's not that the rat just decides to forget being afraid if it damaged the amygdala it just kind of like I guess you could say it stops to care, it's caring about whether or not it's going to die at any given second. You can think of it that way. And in, in a person, that you have the same problem of being afraid when they sh – or, or what, what, what I can't remember what this says. It has the same problem of being afraid when they should be or to fail to recognize the fear in others. And that kind of talks about psychopathy. For example, they don't – they don't show fear to fear-inducing stimuli, and they, because they fail to recognize the fear in others, then they don't register or understand that their actions can actually be harmful of someone else. You could think of it that way. So continuing our tour through the brain, another limbic area is the hippocampus, which is called that because it must have reminded somebody of a seahorse because that's what the name means. Now, one of the main tasks of the hippocampus is to Compare sensory messages with what the brain has learned to explore about the world. And when these expectations are met, the hippocampus tells the reticular activating systems, which is the brain's arousal center, which will cool it to pump the brakes. Because it wouldn't exactly be very useful if your alarm bells went off every time you heard a bird chirp or every time a car whizzes by you. So the hippocampus kind of mediates how a person reacts to order and chaos. And I'll explain where I got that from here in a second. So what that means is that when the expectations of the world are not being met, your alarm bells are going to go off. However, they're silenced when the person is found in order or where the expectations of the world are being met. And the hippocampus is also called the gateway to the memory because it plays a major role in the formations of some types of memories. For example, it enables humans to form spatial memory to aid in navigating in the world or navigating their environment. So I'm going to cut off my video here for a second. So what I have here is Jordan Peterson's map of the regeneration of stability from the domain of chaos, as he calls this. So you could look at it as... Your primary functioning in the world, your mode of being as your as your being in the world. And typically what you're doing is you're moving from what is or an undesirable present toward an ideal of what should be or an ideal future. And so you're going to have these planned sequences of behavior that you're going to be acting out to get you to a predicted outcome or you might have anomaly or unpredicted outcome. So if you have... A per, if your predicted outcome occurs, then you have positive emotion, promise, and pleasure. So predicted outcome is promise, it's pleasure, and so you're going to continue this sequence of behavior. 
If you're met by this anomaly, that's the unpredicted outcome. Well, that's where your anxiety anxiety comes from. That's you know threat and anxiety, which is like a disintegration or a descent into chaos or the underworld from a metaphorical perspective. So if you're looking at this from say like myth or narrative, as as the exploratory hero goes from what is to what they what things ought to be and when things don't go the way they're supposed to it's like a descent into the underworld you can think of that in the movie hercules his what is is he's in love with megara and he wants to be with her and so he does all these heroic deeds but the anomaly the unpredicted outcome is she was actually working for hades and of course i'm referring to the disney ver version of hercules for this because i think that's the one where the most well known and so that's threat and anxiety because he feels betrayed. And of course, Hades takes Megara and takes her into the underworld. And so Hercules decides to descend into chaos into the underworld. Taking the fact that she actually really did fall for him and it wasn't just abject betrayal, he reintegrates this information and decides to plan out a new sequence of behavior. That's he's going to rescue her from the river Styx. He predicts to be successful and he actually is because right before the fates could cut the cord of his life because of his heroic deed he becomes immortal and attains his godlike status and so that's a predicted outcome that's promise that's positive emotion and he continues that sequence of behavior and he gets his ideal future that what should be and so there's so there's the the mythological representation of basically the hippocampus everything's going the way it's supposed to so your model of the world matches your expected expected model of the world matches the world as such and so there's no anxiety no threat just pleasure and promise and pleasure and promise is positive emotion which is going to meet, motivate your actions towards your your goal or your ideal or your value whatever that might be that you're 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 aiming at and anytime that you meet that the the expectations of the world doesn't match the world as such then there's threat anxiety a descent into chaos because where what you thought you knew you don't know and you have to get new information reintegrate that in and then plan out a sequence of behavior to meet, move forward in that so that's how you get this regeneration of stability from the domain of chaos and what all of this means in relation to the hippocampus over here so thought that was pretty interesting and a, a, a good way of also showing how um peterson's work is actually scientifically accurate you could look at it that way so you have the cerebrum and the cerebral cortex it's the largest part of the brain and it looks like cauliflower however this cauliflower is also where the higher forms of thinking happens to take place and the complexity of the human brain circuitry far exceeds that of any computer in existence and much of its complicated wiring is found within this structure so compared with many other creatures we humans may be ungainably feeble and thin skin but our well-developed cerebrum enables us to overcome these limitations and creatively control our environments or you know muck it up according to the environmentalists i had to put a little dig in there at them on that but the cerebrum is divided into two separate halves or cerebral hemispheres that are connected by a large band of fibers that we call the corpus callosum in general the right hemisphere is in charge of the left side of the body and the left hemisphere is in charge of the right side of the body the two hemispheres are known to have somewhat different tasks and talents in, the, in this phenomenon is called lateralization and there's a psychiatrist and neurologist by the name of ian mcgilchrist who wrote this wonderful book called the master and his emissary which talks about the left and right hemispheres and hemispherical specialization and expertise in the brain and at the top of the brain uh, the cerebrum is covered by thin layers of densely packed cells known collectively as the cerebral cortex and these cell bodies in the cortex as in many parts of the brain produce this grayish tissue hence the term gray matter for your brain and other parts of the brain and the rest of the nervous system long myelin covered axons prevail and they provide the brains with what's called white matter 
So your white matter is actually the myelinated parts of your brain, while your gray matter is the unmyelinated uh, cells in the brain. You can think of it that way. Though the cortex is only about three millimeters thick, it contains about three quarters of the cells of the human brain. So it's all packed all up in here. The cortex has many crevices and wrinkles which enable it to control its billions of neurons without requiring us to actually have the head of giants. And our heads would be too big to permit us to be born um, like normal mammals which have fewer neurons and the cortex is less crumbled in rats. It's actually quite smooth. So your brain shape is predicated on the amounts of neurons and connections in your brain. That's why we say there's more connections in the brain than there are stars in the observable universe. And sorry about that. I didn't mean to take the video down. I just thought it would – I hit the thing by mistake. But that's the difference between the different brains, between the different sizes of the mammals in our, in our mammalian family here. So on each of the, of the cerebral hemispheres, there are these deep fissures that divide the cortex into four distinct regions or lobes. And they are as follows. There's the occipital lobe, which is Latin for back of head. And they're, con they're, they're located in the lower back parts of the brain. Among other things, they contain the visual cortex where the visual signals are processed. Damage to this area can cause an impaired vision or even blindness. You have the parietal lobes, which are Latin for pertaining to, law, to, to walls. And they're at the top of the brain, and they contain the soma sensory cortex or the the body sensing areas so anything that goes on on the body it's all up here in the som somatosensory cortex which receives information about pressure pain touch temperature from all over the body the areas of this cortex that receive signals from the hands and the face are disproportionately large because these body parts are particularly sensitive because you're kind of having to be out in the world with your hands and your arms there's the temporal lobe, the temples, and that's what it's Latin for is pertaining to temples. They're at the sides of the brain, just above the ears and behind the temples. They're involved in memory, perception, and emotion. They also contain the auditory cortex which processes your sound, the sounds. The area of the left temporal lobe here is called the Wernicke area, and this is where your language comprehension is taken care of. The frontal lobe, as the name indicates, front of the brain, just under the skull, just under here. And the area of the forehead, they contain the motor cortex, which issues the roughly 600 muscles of the body that produce voluntary movement. The left frontal lobe, a region known as the Broca's area, is involved in speech production. And the frontal lobes are also involved in the ability to make plans, think creatively, take initiative. And it's also the part of the brain that where lobotomies uh, occurred back in the 1800s and in the early 1900s as a what they thought was a way to cure mental illness because of the whole idea of the amygdala and and, and this is where like your emotion area and stuff. So if you were emotionally disturbed, they'd take the needle or the ice pick up through here and they'd sever parts of the amygdala and the frontal lobes to try to you know calm the emotional disturbance. That's why a lot of uh, times there were injuries and so a lot more people were harmed than they were cured. All the variations in the organization of the cerebral cortex exist depending on people's experiences. The lobes of the cerebral cortex will respond in characteristic ways when they're stimulated. So if you were to put electrodes in the somasatory cortex of the parietal lobes, for example, you might feel a tingling or a sense of being touched if that area of the brain is being stimulated artificially. There are other areas of the cerebral cortex that are so that if we're stimulated, you may get nothing, and that nothing is described as silent. And these silent areas are part of the association cortex, which are involved in your higher mental processes. Psychologists are especially interested in the foremost part of the prefrontal cortex. In this area, excuse the absence of video. Is practically non-existent in rats. It only takes up 3.5% in cats, 7% in dogs, 17% in chimpanzees, which I think is our closest mammalian and primate relative, and only 29% in humans. And neuroscientists have long known that the prefrontal cortex and the frontal lobes must have something to do with personality.
And when we get into the person, when I start getting into the, doing the personality class, we'll talk about that a little bit more extensively. One of the other things I wanted to talk about because it just came to mind is the auditory thing in the brain and stimulation. In brains of patients with schizophrenia, what will happen is under an, with an fMRI or an MRI or a PET scan, if you have a patient with schizophrenia in a quiet room who's actively symptomatic, means that they're, they're, they are actively experiencing auditory hallucinations. That's the voices that people report that they hear when they have schizophrenia. Under a PET scan in a silent room, that area of the brain is lighting up as if it's being stimulated, as if somebody's actually talking to that person even though there's nobody around them. And so I thought that was another interesting thing to note when it comes to the when, when you stimulate areas in the brain artificially and you might get like the sensation of being touched the auditory sensors of the sensors in the brain are being stimulated even though there's nobody there and we think that that's and and it's, we think that because it is active in the brains and patients with schizophrenia that's i thought that was a pretty interesting tidbit there so we're going to talk about personality just a, just a little bit and so this is the case of Phineas Gage he was a railroad worker who had an accident that resulted in an iron rod entering beneath his left eye and exiting out of the top of his head, destroying much of the prefrontal cortex. He survived, which was no small miracle in of itself. However, um, his friend said that he was no longer the same person. That the Phineas Gage that he was uh, died when that went through his brain because he was apparently – he was a very agreeable and conscientious, friendly guy. So he was very polite, compassionate, worked hard. Um, but he became very disagreeable. His work ethic disappeared, and he was ended up losing his job and was unable to keep one. And he was reduced to working at a circus sideshow, basically showing the iron rod and you know showing the parts of his face and his head where the thing went in and came out at. The sad, this sad case suggests that parts of the frontal lobes are involved in social judgment, rational decision making, the ability to set goals, and to make and carry through with those plans to get those goals. And that goes back to the amygdala and the frontal lobe and personality and how if there's no activity whatsoever, it's, it it's correlates to the studies done in brains of psychopaths. So you could basically see here that um, – under normal circumstances, people are pretty agreeable and they're pretty conscientious. But even people with antisocial personality disorder, because they don't they don't have any concern for the safety of themselves or others, they break laws, they have no care for boundaries, they're emotionally dysregulated, they're easily able to get in fights, easily angered, and um, and psychopaths are the same way, and they have no fear, and they're very callous and exploitative and predatory. So you can kind of see how parts of the brain kind of correlates to certain traits of, of, of impersonality. So from a big five perspective, um, like I said, compassion, politeness, that's trait agreeableness from a big five perspective, uh, conscientiousness and industriousness. Well, industriousness factors into conscientiousness. The other aspect is orderliness. So it looks like at least two traits from the big five are associated with the uh, frontal lobes. But you know, if being creative, like we talked about in the last slide, it looks like all five of the traits are particularly going to be part of the front lobe of the brain. And depending on your experience, your biological temperament, all of that's going to be predicated in, in what makes your personality. But going back to Gage's case, it illustrates the observing social convention. And ethical behavior takes both knowledge of the rules and intact specific brain systems. Russian psychologist Alexander Luria, and he was the one that I think um, Sokolov, who came up with the uh, orienting reflex, uh, he studied under Alexander Luria, and we'll talk about it, him when we get into the behaviorists, uh, studied many cases of those with damaged uh, frontal lobes and how they lost the ability to govern. Um, to govern their ability to do a series of tasks in the proper order and to stop doing them at the proper time. So, for example, someone with you know brain damage in the frontal lobe uh, 
if you gave them sandpaper or sand down a piece of wood, they would continue doing it and wouldn't stop until like the wood was sanded down to essentially nothing. Lurian was also the one that came up with the idea that you have this model of the world in your head and it had to match the model, the, the world as such. And that goes back to the hippocampus and the order and chaos thing. And if you want to know more about that, you can go to Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning. Or no, it's not Maps of Meaning. It's uh, – I want to say it's the personality and his transformations where he talks about the orienting reflex. No, it is the Maps of Meaning lecture. That's correct. It's actually Maps of Meaning, and he talks about that. So um, uh, I may, at the end of this lecture, put a link to Jordan's uh, – Maps of Meaning Lecture, so because he talks about Alexander Luria and uh, Sokolov. Now, some researchers believe that damage to the prefrontal cortex caused by birth complications or physical abuse in conjunction with a lack of love and other environmental stresses may account for some cases of criminally violent behavior. A study of more than 4,000 boys followed from birth to age 18 found that those who became violent offenders had experienced two risk factors – birth complications that damage the prefrontal cortex and early maternal rejection. Though, although 4.4% of those boys had both risk factors, the boys account for 18% of all violent crimes committed as that sample as a whole. So one question you can ask is, uh, should violent individuals who have prefrontal cortex damage be responsible for their actions and what treatment or punishment should they receive? Well, according to a study from 2014 by Hyde, Bird, Vorba, Voterba, Drizal, Harari, and Manuk, damage to the amygdala found in the prefrontal cortex has potential outcomes which are not good. Not only does damage to the amygdala damp down fear, but it can also result in antisocial personality disorder and subset psychopathy. Antisocial personality disorder is characterized by aggression and antisocial behavior such as violating the rights of others. And when you add psychopathy to that mix, you get characteristics of behavioral traits such as superficial charm, deceitfulness, callousness, lack of empathy, and remorse. And most psychopaths meet the diagnostic criteria for antisocial personality, but not all people with antisocial personality meet the criteria for psychopathy. That's what the psychopathy checklist or advised is for. There's a, it's a 40-item inventory, and you have to score like a certain amount to even be uh, diagnosed with uh, psychopathy or psychopathic personality. Now, the violent behavior associated with antisocial personality, that means that the people with this disorder, they ignore, they infringe the rights of others may, and may also break the law, often from early childhood have experienced neglect and abuse. And so they expect that this is the way the world is, and they tend not to have any remorse or regret for their actions, including fighting, cheating, stealing, and other antisocial behaviors because they see those acts in themselves as survival tactics. So going back to the subset of APD or ASPD, and that's psychopathy, they're defined by a cluster of interpersonal emotional behavioral characteristics, which include impulsivity, grandiosity, callousness, lack of empathy, but the core feature of psychopathy in early is early emerging severe persistent antisocial behaviors, which are often described as immoral, such as committing acts of, viol of violence against others. Psychopaths also show a profound lack of guilt or remorse for their for their actions. So the societal cost of psychopathy is relative, largely high, and mostly due to and in large part due to immoral and often criminal acts committed by these individuals with the disorder because psychopaths are frequently incarcerated for their immoral actions. Thus, thus understanding the factors that contribute to immoral behavior and psychopathy would have significant benefit for society and for psychopaths. And, you know, because according to Sam Harris, psychopaths are irrational and all of that, but that gets into a that gets into a strange philosophical debate that we might have to cover later or might have to be uh, covered in a different class because there are some schools that think of of morality and immoral behavior and psychopathy to be extremely rational because they can intellectualize why they do the things they do because why not be for yourself? Why not only be interested in your own self-interest and why not the hell with other people?
think of that as – and did, okay, so there's a book I can recommend real quick. It's uh, Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky with this uh, character named Raskolnikov who thinks of why not commit a murder? Why not kill his pawnbroker who's not really the nicest lady in the world? Most of the village hates this woman. She treats her – niece who's below average intelligence like she's some sort of slave and he just figures you know the world the world the country the village and him everybody would be better off if he killed her and so he kills her and he gets away with it however raskolnikov after the murder is not the same person he's racked by guilt and remorse and he kind of goes into this delirium about it because his conscience won't let him be and he ends up confessing to the crime and uh gets shipped off to siberia but he said that the punishment that he underwent by his own conscience was worse than any punishment that the that the village people could um that, that that they could have sentenced him to that that going to siberia was not as bad as the pangs of his own conscience but again that's a that's a debate for another time so we can talk about the two hemispheres of the brains and so the subtitle of this of course is split brains a house divided so in a normal brain the two halves they kind of communicate with one another through this this valley called the corpus callosum so the bundle of the fibers that connects them whatever may happen on one side of the brain is instantly flashed to the other side now you might ask the question well what happens if the two sides are cut off from one another well in 1953 Ronald E. Myers and Roger W. Speary took the first steps toward answering this question by severing the corpus callosum in cats. They also cut parts of the nerves leading from the eyes to the brain. Normally, each eye transmits messages to both sides of the brain. However, after the procedure, the cat's left eye sent information only to the left hemisphere and the right eye sent information only to the right hemisphere. Now, at first, the cats didn't seem to be affected by the procedure at all, but by observation, these two guys, Speary and Myers, showed that something profound actually did indeed occur. Because what they did was they trained these cats to perform tasks with one eye blindfolded. For example, a cat can be trained to push a panel with a square on it to get food and ignore a panel with a circle on it with their left eye blindfolded, but when the blind was switched onto the right eye they acted as if they had never been taught the trick at all so it's like one half of the brain knew something and the other half of the brain didn't know that now in all the animal studies ordinary behavior such as eating and walking around remained normal encouraged by this finding a team of surgeons decided in the 1960s to sever the corpus the corpus casalum of patients with extremely debilitating epilepsy in severe forms of the disease disorganized electrical activity um, spreads from the injured area of the brain to other parts however the surgeons thought well if we cut off the connection between the two halves of the, of the cerebrum that it may stop the overflow of electrical activity from one side to the other therefore greatly reducing the severity of the symptoms of epilepsy at least that was their thought process on that and, and so to understand this research, you kind of have to understand how the nerves connect to the eyes of the brain. So if you look straight ahead, everything on the left side of the field of vision is processed on the right half of the brain and vice versa. Everything on the right is processed in the left. And this is true of both your eyes. So I'm going to go ahead and do my wonderful marking here. So you can see the visual field is separated here. So you have the left field and you have the right field. So you have your eyes here and here. Let's just make this as disturbing as possible. So you have this eye here. You have this getting processed all over here. And you have this side of the eye. All this is getting processed over here. Same thing. This side of the eye gets processed all over here. And this side of the eye gets processed all over here. So there's specialization on the uh, – that goes from the optical lens to the retina, the optic nerves, the optic chiasma, which is this thing right here. This is where the nerves kind of all go and separate. And then you have your visual course here and here. So you can see the specialization is pretty – 
right right there. So now we get into the question of dominance between the hemispheres because dozens of people have undergone the split brain operation since the 1960s. And so research on the differences between the hemispheres has also been done on individuals who have intact brains. Using electrodes and brain scans, it was discovered that all right-handed people and many left-handed people all process language mainly in the left hemisphere of the brain. Contrary to proper popular belief, people are not left or right brain. That's just an exaggerated oversimplification of how the brain's hemispheres actually work. Both hemispheres fundamentally will cooperate together in normal brain functioning. So the basis of this perception that the two cerebral hemispheres code semantic information in different ways. Right hemisphere mechanisms are highly sensitive to distant, unusual semantic relations while the left hemisphere mechanisms are strongly focused on few closely related word meanings while suppressing distant, unusual meanings. So what does that mean from a chaos and order perspective? Well, order is again like where things are going the way you exactly want them to. Chaos is when the things you are doing are not working in a way relation to how you want them to. So the left hemisphere, that's this hemisphere of the brain, is considered to be where you process order as it does suppress the unusual meaning. So it says, okay, well, this is this is this is chaos. It's unexplored, it's unknown, it's unusual, so we need to block that out and focus on what we do know. Whereas the right hemisphere is thought to be where you process the chaos. The distant unusual stimuli is characterized by chaos, by the idea of unexplored territory. And so the right and left hemispheres kind of work together in sorting that out. Now, one of the amazing things that the brain does is remember that it can do things. So what are the physiological processes when you remember your first kiss or how to knit a sweater or even learning the anatomy of the brain itself? Well, forming a memory involves chemical and structural changes at the level of the neurons, and these changes differ depending on the, if the memory is being retained for a few seconds, a few minutes, or even longer in contrast to the long-term memory, which involves structural changes in the brain to mimic what they think may happen during the formulation of long-term memory. So researchers will apply brief high-frequency electrical stimulation to groups of neurons in the brains of animals in areas such as the hippocampus. And this stimulation results in the increase in the strength of the synaptic response, which is called long-term potentiation. So in other words, some synaptic pathways become more excitable. Long-term potentiation seems to involve one, an increase in the release of a neurotransmitter called glutamate and the transmitting neurons, and two, chemical reactions in the glutamate receptors of receiving neurons which makes these neurons more receptive to the next signal that comes along. Other changes may occur in the long-term potentiation. For example, dendrites grow and branch out and certain types of synapses increase in number. And in a complementary process, some neurons become less responsive than they were previously. And the neural and synaptic changes in the brain that underlie long-term memory all take time to develop, which may explain why memories can remain vulnerable to disruption for a while even after they are stored. To explain why, for example, a blow to the head will disrupt new memories while leaving old ones alone and, and intact. And so when you locate memories, one of the more important areas in the brain involved in this process is the hippocampus and the adjacent areas, which enables the formulation of long-term declarative memories. These are memories of facts, events, and are the kind that allows you to identify a flower or to tell someone what you had for lunch. The ultimate destination for these declarative memories seems to be in the cerebral cortex and areas that were involved in the initial perceptions of the information in the first place. So we learned about the function of the hippocampus to research with people who have severe memory problems. One man by the, named H.M. had severe epilepsy. It was actually so severe that his hippocampus and amygdala had to be removed before it could be treated with medication. He was unable to make new declarative memories such as learning new words, remember books he read, or remember new people he met. However, in contrast, the formation of procedural memories, that's memories for skills 
and habits that tend to involve different brain structures and pathways. For example, when rabbits are taught to blink their eyes in response to a tone, changes in electrical activity occur in parts of the cerebellum, and if the affected brain tissues are damaged or removed, the rabbits will immediately forget the response and are unable to relearn it. Interestingly enough, though, patients who cannot form new memories or facts or events can learn new skills and acquire new procedural memories. So they can learn how to solve puzzles or play new games, but they can't make new memories of anything else outside of that. Now, researchers have been learning more and more about where memories are located in the brain, and this has been able to help us learn and relate to the encoding of different types of materials, such as words or scenes, to specific areas in the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. So let's talk about hormones and memory for a second. Have you ever smelled fresh cookies or recalled a scene from your childhood? Well, these emotional memories can be explained by our hormones. And you might ask yourself, well, how is that possible? Well, let's talk about that. Hormones that are released by the adrenal glands during stressful events will enhance memory. This makes sense from an evolutionary perspective because arousal means the information is important enough to encode for future use. Otherwise, you wouldn't be aroused and the stimuli wouldn't arouse you to the point of having these hormones be released. Now in real life, sometimes situations are so traumatic that's like watching somebody get killed or having your life almost put in danger can be so traumatic that the hormones secreted during the arousal state will make an event too memorable. For, for example, very high epinephrine levels caused during a traumatic event may help explain why patients with post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD might have flashbacks of that initial traumatic event. And so research has been undertaken to see if medication that blocks hormones, especially after a traumatic event occurs, may actually prevent the development of say post-traumatic stress or even acute stress disorders. It's also hypothesized that maybe it's not the epinephrine itself that's causing the memory to be too vivid and memorable, but perhaps it's because epinephrine increases your glucose levels because epinephrine cannot cross the, bl the blood-brain barrier, but glucose can because your brain needs energy, it needs energy to live. So perhaps it's the glucose that enhances the memory either directly or indirectly or maybe even alters the neurotransmitter's effects. But here's an interesting experiment we can talk about. Healthy and el el healthy elderly people were asked to fast overnight. One group was given a saccharin-laced glass of lemonade and the other group with glucose-laced lemonade. Both groups were asked to complete recall taped messages. This single blind study showed that the elderly people who, blank the, who drank the glucose-laced lemonade actually showed a boosted ability to recall the taped messages five to 40 minutes after hearing it when compared to the saccharin laced lemonade group because saccharin is not really sugar it's 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 a uh, it's a false sugar it's it's a preserve it it's it's a sugar like alternative but it's not like sugar so it's not something that your brain really is going to take part in unlike glucose that it actually needs if that makes any sense and so we're going to talk about uh, why we sleep and the biology of sleeps and dreams, especially if you're in, and the reason why I think this is pretty cool is some clinicians will, you know, interpret dreams or look at dreams as ways to help clients figure out things that perhaps they know, but they don't know they know it because, you know, Freud always thought of dreams as wish fulfillments and that most dreams are just sexual in nature and they're predicated on, on on wishes that are associated with the day's content whereas Jung thought of the dream as your brain trying to tell you something your unconscious mind is trying to tell you something and the reason why dreams are distorted unlike Freud thinking there was an internal sensor trying to keep that information from you Jung thought that was the brain doing the absolute best it can, or at least the mind doing the absolute best it can. Now, earlier when we were talking about um, melatonin and cycles, we discussed that the body goes through these waxing and waning cycles of predictable ways of sleep 
versus waking because if you're in a dark room your melatonin level melatonin levels are going to increase and you're going to go to sleep and then when the light comes in your melatonin decreases and then you wake up so perhaps the most perplexing cycles are that of sleeping and wakefulness so for example one of the obvious reasons that we need sleep is a timeout period to rest that's where our cells kind of eliminate waste products. Uh, cells repair themselves. Your immune system strengthens. Because if we don't get enough sleep, our bodies kind of operate abnormally. For example, proper immune functioning declines with sleep deprivation. You might see increase in psychotic symptoms or you might have a brief psychotic episode because you've been sleep deprived. That's what happens with uh, people with bipolar 1. If they become manic and they go without sleep for a few days, then you become manic with psychotic features. Um, sleep deprivation that lasts four days, it's more than just quite uncomfortable. Um, animals for sleeplessness can lead to infections and eventually death, and the same is true for humans. It's also necessary for normal mental functioning. After a loss of even a single night's sleep, mental flexibility, creativity, attention all tend to suffer. Chronic sleeplessness, high levels of cortisol, which is the stress hormone, may damage and even impair the brain. And after several days, people begin to show psychotic symptoms such as delusions and hallucinations. And so here's this nice little graph that talks about the different waking and sleeping stages. So until the early 1950s, little was known about the physiology of sleep. However, there were breakthroughs in the laboratory of Nathaniel Kleitman, who at the time was the only person to solely research sleep. And it was his graduate student, Eugene Azernis, Azernsky, who had the tedious task of investigating eye movement and sleep. His hypothesis was that eye movements were slow. However, to his surprise and to the surprise of the lab in general, eye movements are actually quite rapid. Using the EEG to measure the brain's electrical, activi electrical activities during sleep, it was found that there were changes in brainwave activity in those rapid eye movements. So, as a result of that research, we now know about rapid eye movement or REM sleep. And it alternates with periods of fewer eye movements or what we call non-REM or in-REM sleep in a cycle that occurs every 90 minutes or so. So the periods of REM sleep will last anywhere from a few minutes to an hour, but the average is about 20 minutes in length. And when we first get into bed, as we relax, our brains give off alpha waves which looks like a regular slow rhythm at a high amplitude, but gradually they slow further down and you drift into the land of Nod. Gotta love those metaphorical references. And you pass through the four stages of sleep, one deeper than the last. And so the examples are here to the right. So that's what your brain looks like when you're awake. Uh, when you start to relax, and try to slow down you go into these in non-rem stage one alpha waves which are obviously much more relaxed and so you're awake state then you get into the theta sleep spindles or the k complexes so that's this right here this is where you're kind of in a moderate sleep you're not as easily awakened then you get into the delta range here of non-rem sleep stages three and four you know waking is very very difficult it's a deep sleep and then what happens down here is you get this rapid eye movement sleep here and this is where dreaming tends to occur is right there so we'll, we'll go through the stages here so stage one that's where your brain waves come small and irregular you feel yourself drift on the edge of consciousness it's a light sleep and if wakened you might recall any fantasies or images that you might have. Stage two, your brain emits occasional short bursts of rapid high peaking waves called sleep spindles. Minor noises aren't going to disturb you most likely. Stage three, in addition to waves characteristic of stage two, your brain occasionally emits delta waves. They're very slow waves with high peaks. Your breathing impulses slow down, your muscles are relaxed, and you're going to be difficult to wake. It's kind of like the sleep of the dead, let's put it that way. Uh, delta waves will take over in stage four. That's considered a deep sleep. It will probably take some vigorous shaking or a very loud noise like a like thunder crashing really loud to awaken you. Oddly, though, that if you walk or talk in your sleep, this is when it will happen. Um, and so that's 
so these sequence of stages here kind of taking anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes and you kind of move back up and down between four and three and then two to one and at that point about 70 to 90 minutes after the onset of sleep after you go to bed something peculiar will happen instead of going into stage one and then wakefulness you enter what's called REM sleep which is characterized by facial twitches and your eyes move about rapidly under your eyelids and the brain is extremely active in REM sleep, yet the body is limp as still. This is why they call it paradoxical sleep, because your mind's going all over the place, but your body's like going asleep, or your body stays asleep still, and all of that. And this is when you're most likely dreaming. And so REM and non-REM sleep will continue to cycle back and forth throughout the night with stages three and four, becoming shorter and shorter in duration until they disappear completely and the REM periods tend to get longer and closer together and this pattern is why you're probably dreaming when the alarm gets is going off because there is no standard regular cycles at all of these either they they vary from individual to individual but the purpose of REM sleep again is kind of up for debate so for example neuroscientists think that when you're dreaming what you're doing is that's where you're encoding all of the information that you're processing for the day, right? Because it's, it's well known and documented that if you study for, say, a couple hours, you go take a nap, and then you go study again, you're going to remember more information than if you try to cram everything in in like six or seven hours. Nobody studies for six or seven hours. The most I can manage any given intellectual endeavor is maybe two to three hours at best before I'm tired. So if anybody says they study for 12 hours, they're full of it. That Freud talked about um, dreams as, you know, wish fulfillments, all of your wishful thinking during the day kind of manifests itself in the dreams and might lead you to some unconscious uh, the material that's unconscious that might talk about like your childhood and things of that nature. And then Jung thought of, you know, dreams as, again, that's your mind acting like a, a counsel to you, trying to tell you things that you need to know and the, the symbols and the things that it uses to do that are that's the best that it can do and then um there's some other debate about um REM sleep in dreams and nightmares is because as we've evolved as humans obviously don't we don't have to worry about saber cats and and, and wolves and all of that coming to eat us because we have these nice houses that we live in and so it's kind of a way for our bodies of dealing with those leftover stresses it's a way of saying you know reliving those anxieties that our ancestors had i think it's something like that so talking about the dreaming brain and so this is going to we're going to talk about all kinds of things here so why do images of dreams arise well we discussed the psychoanalytic views on it a bit when we discussed freud and jung in those lectures however in this slide, we're going to stick to the biological level of analysis rather than, psycho, rather than psychoanalytic. Again, most theories on dreaming have been psychologized by Freud. Remember, he thought of dreams as wish fulfillments, most often sexual or aggressive. Others theorize that dreams help us deal with complex emotional preoccupations of waking life, such as anxieties regarding your relationships, work, sex, health, exams. One example of the student nightmare again is the being naked in your under or in your underpants in a classroom. That's a classic uh, symbol of vulnerability and being aware of that. To be naked is to be vulnerable and to be self-conscious. You could think of it that way. However, biologically speaking, Francis Crick and Graham Mitchison in 1995 thought that dreaming is was when reverse learning occurred. That's where the unused synaptic connections became weaker making memory more efficient and accurate while protecting us from being obsessed with unwanted thoughts or images. Thus, dreams are what they called psychic garbage. Other researchers argue that it makes synaptic connections stronger for encoding recently stored memories, and disruptions in REM sleep impair that process, and normal REM cycles uh, enhance it. However, this doesn't explain dreaming or how it's story-like. One biologist by the name of Alan Hobson came up with this theory of activation synthesis and what his theory is is that neurons firing in the pond simultaneously these neurons control eye movement and so gaze balance posture and all the messages are sent to the cerebral cortex and it's the cortex that tries to make sense of all these signals 
By synthesizing them or integrating them with existing knowledge and memories that produce some coherent interpretation of that. And so the visual, the visual interpretations that are the result of that are what we call dreams. So Hobson thinks of dreams as just this, this random phenomena that occurs because you have all these signals firing in the visual part of the brain there in the, what is it, the ponds? We were talking, yeah, the ponds. And so because they control eye movement, gaze and balance and all of that, your, your, your higher thinking is trying to figure out what the hell is going on with all these impulses. And so it kind of triggers all this imagery of memories and your eye movements and everything as a way it makes sense of all of this. And so that's where they get the idea that dreams are these random psychic phenomena that's as a result of all this thing firing. So in this view, it's not wishes or the external world that makes dreams, but brain step mechanisms making the dreams. However, this does not mean that dreams are meaningless, let's say, because the brain is so conditioned for the quest for meaning that it will create meaning, even if there's little or none to be found from the biological perspective. But by studying the meanings of dreams, we can learn about perceptions, conflicts, and concerns, and without digging so deep like Freud or Jung. However, I don't necessarily agree with the concept that we create meaning. I would say that there is meaning and it manifests itself to us. It's like, it's, it's like when you, we don't necessarily create the meaning, but it's like, it's revealed to us. That's what it means by it manifests. It's revealed to us through our perceptions and through our actions. You could think of it that way. Um, so we get into this oldest question uh, quite a bit. When we think about the remarkable blob between our ears that allows us to remember and to dream and to think, and we are led to question that humans have pondered since we grew beyond our basic needs for survival, and that's where exactly is the self. So when you say, I'm feeling unhappy, your amygdala, the serotonin receptors, and the other parts of the brain are all active, but who exactly is the I that is feeling? And this is kind of where we go into the theology and the philo the, the theological realm and the philosophical realm of things. Most religions think they solve this problem with teaching the idea of the immortal soul or the self existing apart from the brain. However, neuroscientists believe that the mind is a matter of matter. Some may have a personal belief in a soul, but look at the mind, consciousness, and self awareness can be explained in physical terms such as the product of the cerebral cortex. The idea that the brain consists of modules and, and, the, and the self is just this illusion is constant with many Eastern religious and spiritual beliefs. Buddhism, for example, sees the self as this collection of thoughts and feelings and perceptions and concepts that shift and change over time. So you could say that the Buddhists look at the self as a personality and because it is the collection of thoughts, feelings, and perceptions, but it's also embodied in action. Even in this day of technology and understanding neural symptoms, what precisely is responsible for our sense of self and where it's precisely located, we don't know. So I guess you could you could answer this question in the comments if you want, and that's, well, what do you think about where the brain and the self? Are they together? Are they separate? Or is it something completely different that we just don't know? And so I think that would be an interesting thing to talk about. All right, so. Here's our references to this. If you enjoyed this lecture, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell below. Um, I do have my playlist of podcasts that you can also listen to as I talk to different people about different things. I just recently started putting those on video. Um, but yeah, uh, again, in the comments, you can tell me what you thought about this lecture. You can even ask, answer that question about where do you think the self and, and, and the brain and all of that, where they're together and where they're separate and, and share that. All right, guys, uh, thank you so much. And I, I hope you enjoyed the content that I have provided to you.